Hello and welcome back to Technical Service 101's channel. This is the second in a two video series. This is the reassembling of the uh, uh, Budmaster style grow light, which we are converting from its old red blue first generation LED technology to the latest Luxian uh, 1211 Gen 3s. There will be some testing being undertaken, uh, testing and demonstration being undertaken with uh, the case removed on this unit. Once again, please never use, uh, never uh, access the inside of any electrical equipment with the case removed and the plug in. Uh, there'll be an on-screen warning when we're uh, covering that section. Uh, so, on with the reassembly. Uh, okay, so we've got the uh, remachined uh, heatsink unit here with the adapter plate still screwed down uh, you can see the swarf from the drilling so essentially these uh, uh, the adapter plate is fitted and then I take these out to my pillar drill which is in my garden shed and uh, use a pillar drill to get nice straight parallel holes obviously if you don't have a pillar drill these holes can be drilled with a with a hand drill but for precision really the pillar drill is the ideal way to go as you can see there's some nice clearly machined holes now the next process is to uh, thread these holes and for this we'll be using a set of M3 taps uh, these come in a set and uh, I don't know whether that picks up very well on camera there but what you have there is a first taper a second taper and something known as a plug uh, these are essentially um, graduated uh, cutting tips uh, the idea of the tapered ones is that they allow you to start the cutting uh, cutting process uh, they sort of self center in the holes that the, the taper self centers in the holes and this allows you to uh, to begin the cutting process and as you can see the initial turns here it's quite wobbly it doesn't self center greatly but as you can see the tips engaged in the hole and what you have to do is you have to just kind of ging gingerly lead the thing in. You can see uh, my hand's wobbling all over the place there, but once you get a few turns in, uh, as you can see, I'm turning just over half a turn and then turning back at least a third of a turn. And this is so that you break the chip off inside of the, the hole. Uh, a bit of lubrication always goes down well. I found this, uh, I don't know whether this is particularly high silicon and alley or whatever but the uh, consistency of the metal is very uh, uneven through the billet and so I found both drilling and tapping to be a bit of a uh, hit and miss procedure where some of it was soft as putty and other bits were quite hard um, so as you can see now we're getting a, uh, a decent thread in the, the, the start of the hole where we began and this is just leading the tap through and now you can see each turn there's no wobble there the the taps uh, nice and square with the hole and so we just need to like i say take it around about half a turn back a third round half back a third and uh, this breaks off the little chip of swarf that's building up in front of each of the three cut heads as the uh, tip of the tap breaks through the other side as it reaches the, the sort of uh, end of the hole obviously the the cutting it becomes lessened and so you'll find that you can just sort of spin the thing through a few turns occasionally it's very much a matter of feel uh, as you can see there's quite a bit of resistance there when you're breaking back off the chip you can see that the the handle's kind of uh, building up resistance as you turn it back and then it suddenly snaps away and that's the the chip breaking off inside uh, you can see a little pile of chips there on the, the paper there where I've just lifted that up. Now sometimes you do need to be careful with these aluminiums on these um, uh, high speed steel cutters. The stuff literally is like putty and will smear itself all over the cutters and uh, uh, yeah, hence the, uh, the little can of uh, penetrating oil just simply to make the, the cutters run a bit more smoothly over the uh, over the aluminium if you were to try and do this completely dry uh, it would be possible but if you're having to do all six units the chances are that you're going to mess up more than one of the 12 threads that you're going to need to cut in those six units 
So as you can see now the tap's completely breached the other side. And now you can actually see the need for the uh, the plug cutter. Why it's no good trying to do this with just the, the taper ones. Because even with that as far into the hole as it will go there's a shoulder on that tap. So it won't actually go through any further into the hole. Um, the exposed part of the tap there was still well and truly on the, the taper portion of it which means that a th full width thread hasn't actually been cut all the way through the hole at this point. So what we do is we remove the, when it will come, we remove the taper tap. Uh, you could go through the, the sequence of the three taps, but I actually found the mid taper and the plug was all that was required for this job and as you can see the plug there plug one there is threading in quite nicely to the sort of top two thirds of the thread but as you get down towards the bottom of the hole you then come up against the uh, the tapered part that hadn't been finalized that the cutting hadn't been finalized on and then you'll need to just yeah, actually wound in the hole quite nicely anyway and as you can see that's come through clearly now on the the plug tap it's literally just a little 45 degree chamfer on the tip so it's the cutters run all the way to the end and it turns out that the thickness of the uh, heat sink here is pretty much absolutely at the the ultimate length that you could thread with those size taps so now we just go on to the other hole and repeat the process Again, this first bit, oh dear. Again, this first bit's all very much by feel, and you just kind of uh, feel the thing into the hole. And once it starts to cut, you'll find that it will self center and find its own path through the metal. You don't really want to be too wobbly on this first bit because you can uh, make a bit of a, a pig of the hole. Oh, I uh, do need to point out here as well. You can see, as you can see, I'm tapping these from the heat sink, uh, sorry, from the. Um, fan side of the heat sink the reason why i'm doing this was uh having done a few test ones before i found that uh, by tapping them through from the uh the face side that the initial bit of the thread because of all that wobble and the 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 biting in was often not the best of threads and meant that the only type of screw that you could use was a a, a screw that went past the, the the bad piece of the thread and went through to the decent piece so if you're wanting to use uh, short screws, you're actually better off uh, going through from the back of the heat sink and at least having the the, uh, the thread that's facing the cob where you're actually wanting to screw mount it. Uh, a, a pretty decent thread with no chance of any ovaling or... Again, you see, it's uh, really not... A complicated thing just time consuming so once again making sure that that's breached and all the swarfs out the way before winding it back out okay and once again going in with the plug and this threads in quite comfortably straight into the uh, properly cut threads at one end then you can spin it down through because remember the uh, the only threads that we're needing to complete with this particular uh, tap is the ones right at the far end of the hole that the taper portion didn't get to there'll be some thread cut into there it's just uh, not a complete thread and there we have one completed heat sink this is essentially the the, the entirety of the uh, sort of remanufacturing process is simply uh, drilling and tapping these two holes for the the new cob holder. Obviously, don't really want all of that oil all over there. Let's give it a little clean up while we've got a chance. Bit of blood around my finger there. Excuse me, I didn't notice that before. But that's uh, from the, uh, the sharp edges on the heat sink. I did warn you that the. Uh, the yeah, heat sink edges are particularly sharp and if you've got particularly soft hands the gloves may be preferential oops yes 
<laughs> right, so what I'm doing here is just demonstrating that having tapped those from the back side we can use uh, uh, really short little M3 bolts to do an effective job of mounting that and uh, this shows just the tiny amount of play that those cob holders actually allow for it's probably less than 0.5 of a mil in total so this is the reason for the need for the precision for those whole hole placings and once you've got your, your holes drilled often you get a little uh, ring of swarf lifted at the, the entrance of the hole and as you can see there we're just breaking that off with a nice sharp large drill bit Okay, that's just some super fine uh, wet and dry paper being used just to polish up the surface there, ready for fitting the cobs. And you can see that's just lifted a little bit of alley off there. What was that? That was about 2000 grade. It's basically like paper. Okay, so these are our uh, Luxion uh, 1211s. We have 3500 and 4000K, uh, a mixture of. And there's your part number. Now, on these little holders, you'll notice on the top right hand corner there of that one, there's a plus mark and the little black square. And in the bottom left hand corner, there's the minus mark. And you simply align on the front there, you have a plus and a minus mark, marking out the two tabs for the uh, connectors. And conveniently on the back, they put those little squares so that you can actually identify that that's the positive corner. So the square goes to the square, so positive to positive, and you simply lay these into the the holder and snap them in. Simple as that. Uh, this is just some uh, gold CPU paste I'd kicking around. Uh, you can get better, but this was perfectly adequate. And I like the CPU pattern sort of uh, percentage sign uh, pattern for using heatsink paste. And there we go, that's HY610, I think. Uh, stuff was dirt cheap as it goes. Mm, it seems to be pretty efficient, so. And now what we really want to do is we want to make sure that uh, the first touch of the cob and uh, thermal compound on the heat sink is its ultimate contact. So as you can see there, I'm holding it slightly away from the heat sink uh, using these extra long screws just because uh, some of my holes in some of the earlier attempts weren't particularly well drilled and weren't particularly well tapped. So I opted for uh, full size through bolts. And now you can see I've just lowered that down onto the, uh, onto the, the screws so it's just dropped into place. And now we just take the screws up to nearly meet the cob. So as you can see, I'll just leave a little stand off there. And same on this one. And then give it a good kind of push down and wiggle just to smear that heat paste decently across the cob. And then just tighten them down, make sure that everything's secure before pinching them up. And what I tend to do is I tend to pinch them up gently and then just allow a little time for settling. And then just pull down the final tweak. These things, you don't need to tighten these down like I mean, some kind of bloody gorilla. Just, I mean, decent little tweak there with a small watchmaker screwdriver, perfectly adequate and just tighten them down evenly don't tighten one down and then try and tighten the other down 
and just marking the back of the heat sink with the temperature of that particular cob which is one of the 3500s And I think that's the... Oh, right, OK, so that's the 3500, and that would be the uh, 4K. So you want to bear about 10 mil, 8 to 10 mil, I think, of uh, wire at the end of your... Uh, not quite sure what um, what grade this particular wire is. It just came out of a, a, a mains lead. I would suggest from looking at it there, maybe 0. 0.6. And essentially, uh, yeah, there's uh, uh, two little arrowed holes marked for positive and negative. And uh, you literally just bear the wire. I like this uh, rotating the wire under a blade just to partially cut through the the casing and then just simply use a thumbnail to strip the wire off. And again, about 8 to 10 mil of clear wire. As you can see, line up the little arrow and there's the hole. And you just get your pokey bit and poke your pokey bit in the hole. You have to be reasonably deft with these. You can't just go butchering them in the hole. There's a little spring clip inside that hole that you have to kind of force your way past. Uh, really quite impressed with the, the... I mean, as you can see there, it takes quite a tug once it's installed pro properly. And as you can see, there's no bare wire showing there past either of the holes. The insulation on both of the wires is snugged up nicely. And then simply tucking the wires round a few fins not right next to the hole because you don't want to be uh, uh, putting any tension on those and bearing in mind that we still have the um, uh, diffuser lens ring that has to mount to the surface of that around that cob and uh, some of the tolerances there get a bit shallow so this is just for um, uh, measuring the lengths of wire that we're going to need for the uh, for the final assembly so that we can cut our, our duplicate sets of them so essentially just making sure that we've got enough wire to get to the uh, center point on each of those pairs of uh, transformers uh, the reason for this is that we'll be running this in uh, both series and parallel. So the bulbs will be in series and the um, transformers will be in parallel. So there we go, we've cut a whole, whole raft of wires there, all the size. And now get on with the job with cutting them to length. I think I'll have this one on just to show what happens if you muck it up a little bit. That one looks more like 12 mil to me. And 12 mil basically would be too long because the hole only accepts 8 to 10 mil. So there'd be 2 mil of wire. Oh, 0.2 mil of wire. 2 mil of wire? Well, there'd be, um, yeah, 2 mil of wire. Um, uh, exposed outside of the hole. So let's have a look, see what happens. Push it right home. Yeah. So that one wouldn't actually go in far enough. I could still see exposed wire past the insulator. So just snip off the end. Trim it back up to its proper 8 to 10 mil. You do need to uh, twist these wires up quite tightly or they won't uh, go into the hole properly and of course make sure that you've got no stray wires uh, the wire can be quite fine and you can quite easily have a, a stray hair of wire poking out obviously you don't want any of that and repeat the same 12 times
Okay, so I haven't finished wiring all of the cobs. The next job is to attach these uh, uh, diffuser rings. And now you can see why it was quite important where those wires are tucked into the heat sink and how they need to be tucked in quite close to the cob because there's not a great deal of uh, room in there to spare. And what you want to be careful of is tightening that ring down and pinching one of those wires between the sharp edge of the heat sink and the uh, uh, holder. All right, so these are the standoff bolts that each of the heat sinks attaches to. And as you can see, that's got a little nylon top hat on it with the top hat showing upwards. And that was how these came off. So that's how they're being reinstalled. And there's the wired up unit, uh, 4K unit. We're having the 4Ks in diagonally opposite corners. The rest of the holes will be taken up with the uh, 3.5Ks. Can be a little bit tricky to get the uh, screws to line up nicely in the holes. You can't really see what you're doing while you're doing it. And again, always, as always with these sort of uh, units, best always to get all of your screws started first rather than tightening any particular one down, just simply because uh, once one's tightened down, you'll often find that you lack the necessary give, the necessary play in the holes to be able to get the other three or however many lined up. So just wind those home. Again, no real guerrilla tactics needed here. You've got those little nylon top hats. So uh, if you were to over tighten these, the screws would just simply pull down through the little nylon top hat and corrupt those. Uh, funnily enough, the, the machine, the manufacturer on this is pretty piss poor quality. And uh, uh, those screws won't actually wind down a great deal further into their holes, uh, they, they bottom out. I guess if we'd have uh, been a little more prepared here, I would have probably uh, gone out and got some uh, some suitable sized cable in probably red and black, rather than using this uh, um, it's probably 5 amp mains cable from a, a light wire of some description. I had it kicking around, it was useful, uh, rather than throw it away. Remake, re reuse, repurpose. If it's fit for purpose, use it. Uh, bearing in mind that these will be being uh, soldered onto the red and black wiring of the power supplies, so there'll be a clear indication to anybody that opens the unit later, hopefully from the original wiring, uh, that the uh, blue and brown indicate positive and negative so there's the completed unit with all the heat sinks reattached all of the uh, adapter rings available on the far side all looking good there goes my dog Yes, your ass looks very attractive, dear. All right, so now comes the uh, octopus of wiring. Now, I just removed this uh, as a sort of job lot initially. So what I'm doing here is just sort of uh, uh, reordering it back out into the order that it was on the on the uh, in the box originally. Not worrying particularly about placement. This is just purely for uh, assessing and. Uh, evaluating what work needs to be done for the rewire okay so again we have these uh, the mains coming in in the uh, blue and browns there from the IEC socket on your right and these are just simple little uh, clip devices again touch cheapskate six wires five pins uh, five holes so some of the wires are doubled up and yeah, you just simply lift those arms and they release the wires. And that's just a single block connector which essentially acts as a bus. So that is all for one polarity. So that will be the negative one and this will be the positive one. 
have to be quite careful with these sort of things. The plastic can be quite brittle, especially with time. And that's my beautiful assistant. So now what we have, now what we have is the uh, mains and the uh, DC voltages separated so we can tuck the mains wires out of sight. So just clearing up the working area there and yeah and as you can see with the uh, blue and the brown wiring there it would be relatively easy to get confused so uh, like I say it would probably have been prudent to have stuck to the red and the black wiring of the so just plugging in uh, yeah red and the black wiring of the uh, original configuration uh, so just plugging in a fan there just to ascertain uh, like I said in the first video these plug sockets are idiot proof the 12 volt fan can't plug onto the 72 volt plug because they're, although they're the same plug and socket they're oppositely wired so one is male and the other's female uh, on the, the the two sides so they're one's one's uh, yeah they're incompatible you can't connect them the wrong way so now we just need to cut off the 72 volt ends because we won't be reusing those So I haven't ascertained that that's the 72 volt plug. Cut those off pretty close. So now we just separate the wires. They're both kind of joined, joined at the hip. And then we want to strip back a reasonable portion, maybe uh, 12, 13 mil minimum, maybe a little more. And then we connect black to black and red to red and twist them together for soldering. So these power supplies are now connected in parallel. So we have two uh, 12, 1300 milliamp uh, power supplies. And by uh, joining the two together in parallel, we keep the voltage at 72 volts, but double up their uh, milliamp rating so taking that up to uh, 2400 milliamp 2600 milliamp and then we have the uh, black and the red wires heat shrinked uh, with some heat shrink ready and waiting over them uh, they're already tinned and then we solder the uh, our brown wires to the red and our blue wires to the black now what we do here is one cob we have a brown wire coming from one cob going to the red wire and we have a blue wire coming from its partner from its uh, paired twin cob going to the negative because we're going to be having to wire the uh, cobs in series because of the 72 volt supply and the 36 volt cobs So you just push the heat shrink down over the bare wire and with a little little spot of heat from the soldering iron. And that shrinks around the wire if you're not familiar with heat shrink. And I've got an extra bit of the heat shrink there, slightly larger for additional security just to make sure there's not too much tension on those soldered joints. The belt and braces never goes amiss. Stuff's cheap as chips, always use loads of it. It's not worth scrimping on. So now what we're doing is we're joining the negative wire from one cob straight to the positive wire of the other cob. This is to wire the two cobs in series. So we take the 72 volts and we divide it between the two cobs and the cobs then run at the 36 volts and the paralleled 2400 milliamps is now divided between the two cobs reducing it back down to the 1200 milliamps that the co cobs require to run on and what i'm doing here is just temporarily wiring these first two cobs uh, we haven't actually taken any voltage readings or 
uh, amperage readings from any of these units. We've simply gone by the uh, what it says on the tin. And so it's a bit suck it and see. Uh, it would have been a matter of simplicity itself to actually test the voltages, but we're a slack pair of git, so couldn't be bothered. Uh, and so as you can see there, deploying the two negative supplies for the cobs and the two positive supplies. And just reattaching the earth, the earth lead to that. Uh, heat sink on the far end there just to make sure that the unit is earthed while I'm running it with the mains exposed again do not do this at home this is for uh, testing purposes only and just in my defense there the uh, as you can see there the actual uh, the bare mains connections on the back of that IEC are in fact covered by insulators but still fairly right, and there's first sight of the first two in action and running so this is really the first indication that we've had that the uh, milliamps and the voltage is good for the cobs that we're using and they look nice and bright so we know that we're running about right. right just pull that back apart and complete the uh, wiring and soldering job reattaching the uh, uh, sort of supporting clamps I suppose you would call them okay so they're nicely fastened now now just simply tucking the wires out of the way as neatly as possible on this initial one I left those uh, wires sort of running underneath the fan and uh, as an afterthought I, afterthought I realised that they would have been uh, far better off had they been rooted uh, just simply around the bottom of the heat sink so uh, on all of the later fan fitments I pulled those out of their slots and sort of uh, rooted them around under the heat sink And just simply because the, uh, as you can see, the wires there are bowing up, and we've got a spinning fan above them. And the last thing that we want is the wires to be being cut into by the uh, movement of the fan, or for that matter, stopping the fan from running and overheating the cob. Uh, the observant among you may have noticed that I am uh, reassembling this with the fans pointing in the opposite direction to their original fitment. The uh, airflow of this case, as you can see, the vents are all louvered downwards, and this just seems completely uh, uh, illogical to our setup where this is gonna be going into a, uh, a light hood with its own uh, airflow. So uh, pushing the, the hot air up into the airflow is a far more appropriate solution for this job. And so here we have all the fans, all the heat sinks and the wiring now reinstated. Uh, you need to pay attention to those mains blocks. You need to make sure that your wires are tucked in properly, that there's no exposed wires. And just generally making sure that everything's hunky-dory there inside the box. And as you can see there, the camera is having to iris down majorly to deal with the uh, intensity of these. And just testing that all of those fans are running nicely, that there's no clipping noises. And Jesus, those things are bright. Yeah, as you can see. A little concerned about whether or not that was catching, but it actually turned out to be that just that fan is uh, um, just the bearing on it's a little bit rough. So, all that's left to do is to refit the deep diffuser units, reflectors first.
because we're not using the square LEDs that these reflectors were originally designed to use for and our circular ones are smaller than the square hole uh, it really doesn't matter how these are lined up they just drop in the hole you can get a rubber gasket for these as well but uh, again like I say this is all being fitted into a light hood so uh, it's all protected from the environment in our particular fitment often best to turn these uh, aluminium rings backwards until you feel the start of the thread overlap and that way you won't cross thread them when you do tighten them down the threads aren't particularly well machined on these uh, cheaper Chinese units and if you cross thread them they'll be useless basically if you cross thread them you'll just strip the thread out of one side or the other so uh, worth being reasonably careful how you screw these on and off and once they're down, they do need to be reasonably tight. And repeat four more times. Now, as you can see, having a little difficulty with that last one. Again, dodgy threads. Okay, once more, never use electric equipment with the covers removed. Looks a bit myopic now, but Mr. Magoo. Oh, Jesus, they're bright. As you can see, you can still see my hands and everything in image there. You can see that the camera hasn't really irised down particularly. Oh, buffing my fingerprints off the worst room. Although, on afterthought here, a few fingerprints ain't going to stop nothing with these things. But for the sake of presentation. And so there's our two 4Ks, the rest are in 3500. And yeah, camera and iris down like a mofo. very happy with that unit okay here's the unit on test <laughs> yeah right good luck with that anyway just to point out here the uh, the light meter that we're using is in Lux and we are measuring out on the uh, 100 times scale so you have to put an extra two zeros at the end of whatever numbers we, we're hitting. And those numbers really are quite extraordinary from this unit. Um, we were seeing approximately 70,000 lux at a meter. And that was uh, going up to more like 110,000 at canopy height. And just, to, I mean, you can see from the intensity of the light there hitting my, my hand, you can't really see it from the side on because of the lens units. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, well, you could just about see the seven. Yep, yeah. seven three. Okay, so there you go. 73,000. 73,400 lux. And that was at a metre. Okay, well, there's your, uh, your reassembly video. I hope you're impressed. Uh, we've now got the um, uh, consumption figures in from this unit, and the uh, consumption is uh, around the 246 watts running wattage, and the um, uh, in situ meter square environment is actually returning more like 90,000 lumens at, uh, at a meter. So uh, the uh, white walls surrounding it is uh, bringing even more light into the, uh, the field area. So yeah, very effective light units. Uh, details will be in the uh, description and uh, hopefully I'll be uh, releasing a very much shorter, tighter edited version of these two videos as an introduction for those people that aren't wanting the uh, the level of detail 
that these two videos have gone into. Uh, thanks for watching. See you soon.